priest of the royal sanctuary, Bethel, Bethel, house of God, Amaziah, sends word to the king, Jeroboam, about this nuisance of a prophet, what we would call a conspiracy theory. Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The lamb is not able to bear all his words. Then he quotes some of them against the king. And then the prophet is told in no uncertain terms where to go. O seer, says the priest, go flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. One of the royal chaplains, the bishop down there in London, said something against some event up in Scotland and was discreetly invited to be careful. Eventually, of course, he went over to Rome. But it's interesting that one cannot say certain things in certain situations. P.C. reigns in the pulpit. And so, if one doesn't observe the sovereign rule of P.C., one will likewise be told where to go. <coughs> if one talks about certain places, notably, not so much heaven, because it's automatic, isn't it? But purgatory, and certainly hell, one will also be told, in no uncertain terms, where best to go. The advantage of not being in a pulpit is that one doesn't have to obey the command of PC. And so let's go somewhere hot, where there is real climate change and global warming. I picked up this morning, by chance, this page of the manuscript of Purgatory, which was translated me back in the early 80s. It's hot. This is totally un-PC, and it smashes the officialdom of those who preach that death means heaven. It isn't possible for us to understand, says the soul having a rough time on the other side, while yet on earth, what God requires of a soul that is expiating its faults in purgatory. So you believe, do you, that a large number of prayers, or what is more well recited, will put a soul almost immediately in possession of eternal bliss. Such is not the case. Who can fathom God's judgments? Who can comprehend the purity that he requires of a soul before he admits it to participation in his eternal happiness? Alas! If people only reflected on these things while yet on earth, what a life they would lead. Examine seriously how many venial sins a negligent person, one who is little concerned for his salvation, and is well glued to the earth, commits in one day. How many minutes does he give to God? Does he as much as think of him with reflection? Think hard. Contemplate 365 days 
of this kind in one ear. And if a large number of ears follow in the same pattern, this person dies with a soul loaded with a multitude of venial sins which haven't been effaced because the thought never came to him. Only just is there left in the soul thus overridden one tiny flicker of love when it comes to give an account of its life to the one who requires it back again. You have before you all these almost worthless lives which have to be lived all over again in expiation. Lives devoid of love of God of purity of intention. The soul which must live on God has not lived for him. It has therefore to start its life all over again and that with unheard of sufferings. It didn't take advantage of divine mercy upon earth. It was a slave to its body. Once in the place of purifying, it has to make satisfaction right down to the last might. And find once more <coughs> its first splendour. This for those souls that are indifferent with regard to their salvation. But for the souls that are yet more guilty still, it's another matter. Love God to such an extent that you will not be obliged to come here to acquire his love by means of meritless suffering. Sufferings on earth, things that hurt and bother, are meritorious. Don't waste them. Above all else, have love. Love effaces many faults and also makes them be avoided. Because a person doesn't want to hurt the one he loves. That's why the soul that loves Jesus in truth keeps herself constantly on her guard and avoids all that might wound his divine regards. I've come across testimonies of souls making themselves known that one presumed, because of their holy life, were in glorious bliss, but actually they were having a rough time long after. As for the Protestant doctrine that one goes straight either to heaven or to hell at the moment of death, it's cruel. We'd all go to hell, <coughs> practically. <coughs> the number of souls, even very holy souls, who avoid some purgatory is minute. Apparently, even Padre Pio had a tiny moment in purgatory. That, therefore, is what it means to come into the presence of the All-Holy, the Divine Majesty, before whom 
even the angels could not stand. Lucifer was the most brilliant of them all. And it's interesting that what got him to fall, pride, ownership of what he had, and independence, I will not obey, is precisely what we see on earth over a large part of this planet. Pride. And this new norm of classing faith as backward, irrelevant, imbecile even, is a very subtle form of the same thing. It's nothing new under the sun. The creature yesterday was not. It thinks it owns what it has and it can easily cancel the unseen because it's not seen or heard. I don't believe there's anything there. Therefore there's nothing there. Who is the imbecile in that argument? If only humanity saw the dangerous situation of the soul hovering over eternity and not taking half a thought for its well-being when it pays thousands on the care of its physical beauty and order. What is a good bank account? What is a reputation when the soul at the moment of death is poor, nude and helpless? For one second after death, no popularity will help at all. Only one thing could come in there, the soul itself, in its poverty recognised, crying out, HELP!